stage is a distinguished panel who represent many perspectives on technology and innovation in the food space. Carol Kreiner will introduce and lead this conversation. Carol is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Accounts for Technology Business at HCL Tech and a board chair of the Global Food Banking Network. Please welcome our speakers to the stage. Okay, well, let me start by um, first just announcing what this uh, session will be focused on. It'll be tech technology as a solution to food access. And so we want to keep this very uh, conversational. We'll certainly make uh, time for questions. Um, and I'll start, by, I'll start by making uh, quick introductions of, of who is with me, and then I'm going to also ask a couple of audience questions, and then we'll go right into um, our discussion. So first, I'd like to um, thank all, all the panelists for being here. I'd like to first um, energy, introduce Evan O'Brien, who's a co-founder of Food Cloud. Additionally, we have Leon Smith, who's a data lead for Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability. And we have Maria Eugenia Torres, who is chief executive of Red De Alimentos. Terrific. We also are gonna be bilingual, so if you wanna put your um, earbuds in, that would be terrific. Okay, quick question. Raise your hand if you have, and this is about seeing where everybody is. Raise your hand if you have any active AI-related POCs or projects that are in motion. Any? Okay, okay. All right. Raise your hand if you plan to make an investment in technology this year. Okay. Raise your hand if, if you don't mind, if you have experienced any resistance and adoption within your teams as part of technology. Okay, wonderful. This is very, very helpful. <clears throat> and, and one more quick question is, um, is this. When it comes to topics of AI, Gen AI, anyone think it's all hype? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. Okay, that's terrific. <laughs> That's terrific, that's terrific. Well, what I'd like to do then with, with that, Leon, is um, I really wanted to start with that question. I was gonna phrase it a little different, mm. but you see that no one thinks that this is hype, so where would you say we are? Just firstly, thank you for the GFN for the invitation. So we had all this planned out about <laughs> resistance to the hype, but uh, no one put their hand up. Yeah. But, there's a, there's a current wave of technology change going on right now, and it, it started in 2022 when a little company named OpenAI released a service that made things magical, and that was ChatGPT. The reality, though, is artificial intelligence has been around for decades. You could go back to the 50s with Alan Turing. Uh, you could even go back to World War II with Enigma when we were breaking code. So this concept of artificial intelligence is not new, and also this concept of disruption is not new to humans. Uh, if you think back through time, I won't go right back to uh, industrial revolutions, but imagine being a fireman in Brooklyn. And back then, in the 20s, you had three horses that drew your carriage down the road, and that's how you put out fires. And you've been protesting for a number of years because this big company wanted to introduce the internal combustion engine. And the people that made saddles were resisting, the people that look after the horses were resisting, <laughs> Now, this is also in Brooklyn, where you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people living. There's a, there's a bit of a problem with horses when you have humans and horses living in the same space. A lot of uh, waste from horses. That was what was happening in the 1920s. But that change then enabled all sorts of benefits, being that we could introduce transportation. Go through to the 80s. Uh, primary school teachers were protesting about calculators coming in. It was going to ruin mathematics. Uh, hands up if you don't want to have the ability to use a calculator and would like to go back to calculus by first principles and <laughs> mathematics. Uh, 
You could even go to the 90s, depending on the ages of the room. That was when the World Wide Web was coming out. So we'd had this thing called the internet before, but no one quite knew what this World Wide Web was. Why would I need a graphical interface to computers? Yet, who would like to go back to not having the internet, as we call it today? Mobile phones that enable us to have conferences and instant translation like we are. So these are all these disruptions, and we're living one right now with artificial intelligence. And we're, being that we're at the start of that journey, we also don't know quite what the business models that will come out of it. So we're seeing some, but I think for the room, we had uh, some were doing projects, some weren't. But just uh, consider that these technologies may be able to enable all sorts of change in your business. So we, earlier session around the methodology fr frame, the methodology framework for uh, methane. Sitting behind that is technology, uh, Microsoft technology. We're <laughs> participating and supporting that. Uh, in Belgium, uh, we're actually helping organisations track bees. So if you think about food, uh, one third of nearly all food is pollinated by the humble bee. And the humble bee actually travels around large distances. And what it also generates is a lot of data. That data is about the pollen that it attracts. So uh, Bioversity, a partner of ours, said, well, maybe we can work out what's happening across a large area in terms of the amount of chemicals being used, pesticides, the amount of irrigation needed, and ultimately increase yield. So there's some examples of AI directly in the food side uh, could be enabling and empowering organisations to do more, and uh, in our case, about improving the food chain. So do you place AI in the same category of some of the other examples in terms of what you think the impact will be the next 10 years? I'm very optimistic about where AI is. Uh, it is, from both our company's point of view, but also me being a technologist, it will be a disruptive change. And over the next five to 10 years, we'll see a lot of that. And partly because the technology, the, the underlying infrastructure has allowed researchers and scientists to deliver on what they thought was a academic paper. And I use OpenAI again. The technology didn't exist back in 2017 when they originally that paper uh, was created. So as we move forward, we'll see all sorts of business changes. The, the caveat that I would add is right now is a really good time to think about the responsibility of that AI. And that always stays true to any organisation or any change. It's just making sure that it is implemented in a way that's consistent with your own brand and your own business. So it needs to be inclusive. It needs to be fair. It needs to be accountable. So now is a really good time. If you're not in a project around AI, it's just thinking about your own responsibility frameworks or what the industry would call the guardrails. Uh, so AI should be an assistant to you. It should improve your productivity. Uh, back to those other examples, it's not about replacing people, it's your co-pilot in business. Uh, so if you're not in a current AI project, I'd consider just looking at the responsibility of those as it's introduced to your business. Yeah. Well, even with your experience at a nonprofit, I think I was telling you at the reception that it was just a few weeks ago, I had a, a team in my office in Seattle from Ireland and they were talking about, and this is Microsoft, and they were talking about the technology that you've developed. So I'd love to hear your perspective on um, an experience bringing technologies into food cloud as well as working with others. Yeah. So I'll use the real example of, oh, uh, yeah. oh, oh, oh sorry. Ahead. I thought it was still with you. I was, That's all right. Yeah, ready, but, um, yeah come so, back. So you'll but, get another turn in yeah. just a moment. <laughs> Um, and it isn't, uh, it, it wasn't orchestrated, but we do use a lot of Microsoft tools as well. So um, for those of you that don't know, we've developed a technology platform in Ireland where we redistribute surplus food from retailers, food service directly to community organization. And that complements our traditional warehousing solutions. So we have three warehouses across the country, and then we've shared that technology platform with partners like Fairshare, and more recently, Food Bank in Kenya and Food Cycle Indonesia, who are all here. Um, so I suppose there's two elements to what we do, like the more traditional element. We definitely were using um, existing platforms. So for example, in our warehouses, we're using a Microsoft product so called Microsoft Business Central, mm -hmm. where you know I suppose there's a lots of warehouse management systems out there if you 
don't want to, if you can avoid it, building your own technology, leveraging existing is really important because as Leon says, the AI is going to disrupt everything. So, you know, if you're investing in your own customized platform, it's very hard to keep up to date. Whereas if you're, in, if you're using tools like, like Microsoft, um, you're going to keep up quickly with having access to real-time data and all of that. But in our case, then, we did have to customize and develop our own technology to, for our purpose, which was trying to directly connect surplus food where we did uh, to community organizations. Um, so I suppose in our experience as introducing technology, um, we find that the food industry are really hungry for technology. So they are really, um, I suppose, pushing the boundaries in terms of what technology can be used for in terms of maximizing the amount of food that can be donated. Um, and we've got some great partners of big companies like Tesco who are really taking a leadership position on that. And they're really putting um, pushing the boundaries in partnerships with, with their food redistribution organizations to get as much food out as possible. Mm. And then on the other side, we're working with NGOs who are in most cases resource constrained and not necessarily, um, in all cases, not necessarily super keen on adopting technology. So I'll just give you one example. <coughs> Um, so, for example, we have an integrated technology platform. It's very sophisticated, real-time data, auditable. But on the other side, the NGOs and the charity and beneficiary agencies, they really just wanted to stick with, you know, a text message. So on the one side, they, we were getting, you know, challenged from retailers. How do we get the most food out? And we knew the only way we were going to do it was to try and move our um, NGOs onto apps so that they could see more. Um, but it did take us a while to, I suppose, build the case for our um, beneficiary agencies to actually make that step to move from SMS onto an app, for example, so that we could then drive more impact. So that would be an example. Um, and and then I'm sure if anybody is running networks of warehouses, if you've got a warehouse team that are used to a system, even if it's manual, it does take a lot of change to get them on board. So our warehouse manager in our Dublin warehouse, when we changed from like a customized system to a, the Microsoft tool, he said it was like we came out of the 1980s and into the 21st century. And even though he was the one who resisted it uh, a lot, when now he's so proud to be able to demo our technology, but that was a journey. So you have the wow. uh, challenge, I suppose, within the world where we work, which is you've got really tech hungry, data hungry donors, food companies, and then you've got warehouse managers, drivers, and, NG and ultimate benef um, FLOs or beneficiary agencies that would just prefer to give you a call. So you're trying to create solutions that can manage both. And that's actually really hard, but I suppose it's really exciting because that's the role that we play, you know, as intermediaries between the food companies and the, um, the NGOs. So. so building upon that, I'd love to hear, Ken, of some examples of challenges that you faced implementing technologies. Eh, bueno, primero agradecer a YFN eh, por, por, por permitirnos compartir la experiencia de Chile. Eh, dentro de los desafíos que nosotros asumimos eh, y, que, y que la tecnología nos logró eh, ayudar en, a entender es eh, el primero por cómo, cómo crecer eficientemente en el rescate de los productos, en el rescate y la distribución de los productos. Eh, nosotros hasta el año 2016 teníamos un centro de distribución, un, un warehouse, eh, y con ello podíamos atender a las organizaciones sociales que estaban cercanas. Y, otro de lo, y, y por lo tanto, estábamos eh, entregando eh, en ese, solamente en ese sector de Chile. Y teníamos el segundo desafío, que era expandir a todo, el rescate a todo el, a todo el país, que en esa época no existían otros bancos de alimentos en el país. Y la verdad es que la tecnología eh, nos permitió... Eh, Salvar esos dos, eh, esos, dos, esos dos desafíos que teníamos el año 2017, gracias, perdona, pero gracias a un fondo de Google, <ríe> eh, nos ganamos un fondo de innovación de Google, eh, que nos permitió desarrollar esta tecnología. Y dentro de los eh, desafíos que, que teníamos era efectivamente cómo poder eh, rescatar en todo el país. Y la verdad, y la, en, por lo menos en Chile, 
el rescate de, de poner centros de distribución en distintas partes de, del país era muy caro. Eh, de, medioambientalmente también eh, andar recorriendo el país con camiones es caro y medioambientalmente muy ineficiente. Y por lo tanto, eh, una plataforma tecnológica que fue la que desarrollamos nos permitió conectar en forma directa a las empresas que tenían dónde estaban los productos para rescatar con las organizaciones sociales que estaban cercanas. Dentro de los desafíos que efectivamente eh, teníamos era que las organizaciones sociales pudieran adoptar esta tecnología. Para eso es muy importante, y se habló ayer en uno de los, de los paneles de, la, de las salas, que sea fácil de utilizar, eh, que para la organización social sea muy simple de, de poder entender cómo hacer estas solicitudes. Y lo otro que también nos permitió es poder eficientar eh, y mejorar nuestra calidad de servicio a las organizaciones sociales. Y nuestro propio sistema. Nosotros antes eh, teníamos que dedicar casi cuatro horas en la asignación de productos a las organizaciones sociales. Y en esa época nosotros movíamos 3 millones de kilos al año, con un poquito más de 130 organizaciones sociales, y nos demorábamos cuatro horas en asignar lo que teníamos que entregar a cada organización social. Hoy día rescatamos más de 14, casi 14 millones de kilos anuales, atendemos a más de 400 organizaciones sociales y la, el, 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 la tecnología nos permite que la organización social pueda en microsegundos entender lo que hay disponible en el centro de distribución, pedir una hora y, y, as, y asignarse una hora para ir a buscarlo y por lo tanto nosotros en todo ese tiempo que, no, que estamos asignando manualmente, hoy día lo dedicamos a poder tener el, el picking listo para la organización, la organización llega y en cosa de minutos ella se va. Antes llegaba a las 8 de la mañana a nuestro centro de distribución para esperar su turno, porque nosotros estábamos preparando los pedidos, la organización social estaba 4 o 6 horas en día esperando a que nosotros le entregáramos nuestro centro de distribución. Hoy día llega fija eh, al día siguiente a las 11 de la mañana, a las 11, 11, 10, nosotros le estamos entregando el pedido. Entonces, la tecnología nos ayuda mucho a la eficiencia. Medioambientalmente es súper obvio que no, no deberíamos andar trasladando productos por las carreteras de ningún país, digamos. Eh, pero tam, yo le tengo respeto a lo que es la inteligencia artificial. Yo creo que la inteligencia artificial, hoy día no, lo que nosotros tenemos es una eh, digitalización y es una eh, automatización de procesos mecánicos. Eh, me, perdí el retorno, perdí el retorno. Ah, se me acabó el, el, el audio. Eh, es una digitalización. Creo que la inteligencia artificial nos puede ayudar a incluso eficientar aún más los procesos, entender, pues la inteligencia artificial, la gracia que tiene es que eh, aprende de, de lo, del pasado y por lo tanto podríamos asignar y ofrecer de acuerdo a lo que la organización históricamente necesita, históricamente le gusta y por lo tanto podríamos ser cada vez más eficientes. Eh, todavía, modestamente, nosotros todavía no hemos implementado inteligencia artificial en nuestro proceso, eh, pero creo que el mundo va para allá y creo que nos puede ayudar muchísimo en, en, todo, el, en todo lo que viene para adelante. Ok, terrific. I want to I want to switch gears and talk a bit about data, but before I do so, Leon, was there anything more you wanted to share? Uh, no, no, that's okay. <laughs> So much of what we're trying to um, implement is about serving up information so decisions can be made that are the right decisions and you know how data structures are created and how information is served up in an understandable way is just really um, important. So we'd like to have a little bit of you know, feedback in terms of how you think about that. And so I want to go back maybe Leon to you for your thoughts for Microsoft. All decisions are underpinned by data, and the data needs to be trusted. Uh, in the previous session, we talked about uh, the frame methodology and the underpinning structures under that. For us to measure, we need to, for us to manage, we need to measure. So there's a few different expressions. One we use is record, report, and reduce. You need to record the data. And to do that, just as we're using two languages now, we're translating, we need to record it in a way that can be exchanged. So you need a common language, a common standard. The challenge in this space, this ESG space, uh, at Microsoft we track 1,265 standards right now. There's a lot. Uh, so there's a real challenge in the world right now, depending on the area. So we talked about hunger, uh, UN SDG 2, but if we go across to 13 and climate change, 
there's all these other standards. And then you start getting pockets of standards within countries. Fortunately, countries are actually enacting change. Uh, even Australia, for those in the room, our Senate passed legislation two weeks ago. What that will do is introduce Australian sustainability reporting standards to all organisations. Large organisations will start from 2025. This, mo this momentum is happening globally. Uh, we have what's called the uh, CSRD in all of the European Union. What that needs is data, and it needs common data and shareable data, and it will flow down and, and become either a burden for the not-for-profit and the social impact or a benefit. So it can work both ways. But yeah, at a large, large, pro, or a, a large scale, what the planet is trying to do is really manage, in a climate sense, 51 billion tonnes of carbon going in the atmosphere, and we all want to get to zero by 2050, and we don't want to be uh, double counting, not counting, uh, incorrectly counting, all of those. Right. So that's what we're really doing at a platform level as Microsoft. Uh, one of our fundamentals is we try and empower every person and organisation to achieve more. Mm. So in this space, it aligns with our goals, is we're building these underlying platforms and also enabling these underlying data standards to allow large-scale data transformation. Mm. Even, can you talk about how you're using data in your work? Yeah, so it does chime a lot with the previous session. So we're, I think as Food Bank, we're really fortunate that our impact is very tangible in some sense. So for example, tons of food, you can um, turn that into carbon, water, and um, the frame methodology is excellent and it's going to be a game changer for the whole network, I think. Um, but we also have things like volunteering. We have the S in the ESG, which I think a lot of our partners are struggling with in terms of capturing that. Um, so it is the, although we collect, I think it's half a million data points every month, which is really difficult then to try and manage all that. But the, the tonnage part is actually the most straightforward, if you like. And I suppose we are challenged as a food banking community to try and pick what frameworks we align to. So. In Europe, we have CSRD. Globally, there's the GRI framework, which is slightly different. In our world, you've got funders who are looking for a certain type of data, and then you've got food companies looking for others. You've got government looking for others. So it is quite challenging, I think, if we start and get our head around the tonnages and the carbon. Um, then we can talk about, say, the volunteering and the social side. But I think the social side is difficult to capture because you know, I know from uh, the last couple of days talking to all of you, the impact of volunteering, for example, is really important to corporates. Um, but what, how do you translate that into something that they can put into their sustainability report? So it is about tons and carbon and water and calories um, and land use. And then you have to then add the social um, impact of the work that we do as well. And it's almost, if we could, um, you know, work together to decide on a methodology together. It's what we've done the, when the frame methodology is really helpful. It will help us all. So we're not all trying to figure out how are we using our data to tell our stories to our different stakeholder groups. Yeah. yeah. So can I, I'd love to hear from your perspective this, this topic of change management and embracing change and doing so with innovation in mind. would love to hear some, some more of your learnings. Um, in terms of gestion of change, effectivamente, hay veces que cuesta, eh, que cuesta un poquito más. Eh, a nosotros, particularmente, en el equipo interno del Banco Alimento, no hubo un tema eh, respecto de gestión de cambio. Eh, pero eh, cuando nosotros empezamos este proyecto el año 2017, antes de eh, meter un dedo en el código, digamos, para, para empezar a desarrollar la plataforma, lo primero que hicimos fue, uno, conseguir, o, eh, y, y tenemos la suerte de que Walmart Chile es un socio estratégico de la red, y por lo tanto, trabajar con un socio empresa, co-hacer co, co el proyecto fue muy importante para entender qué es lo que necesitaba la empresa, qué es lo que le simplificaba la vida a la empresa incorporando la tecnología y por lo tanto ser mucho más receptivo eh, y tener mejor recepción en las empresas. Y por otro lado también hicimos todo un catastro con las organizaciones sociales nuestras 
eh, para entender qué tan familiarizadas estaban con la tecnología. Eh, y tenemos la suerte que al, que al menos en Chile eh, las organizaciones sociales están bastante eh, familiarizadas con lo que es un computador, con lo que es una, una aplicación en el celular, y por eso que tenía que ser muy simple. Eh, pero en, a, levantar esos posibles warnings de, eh, de, de temas que nos pueden poner piedra en el camino, creo que es muy importante antes de partir desarrollando eh, eh, cualquier cosa. Eh, yo creo que eso es fundamental. The full panel, a, a question which is circling back to AI and use cases. What use cases do you see? Do you think about when you are reflecting on AI and how it might fit in the in this food banking climate? So I mentioned AI is not new. It's just the applications are progressing very rapidly now because the technology is there. So what artificial intelligence as a field and machine learning is very good at is reasoning over a large amount of data. Uh, so, and also coming up with trends, correlations, patterns, helping you forecast, helping you predict, helping you do what-if scenarios. So what would be the difference if we change this component in our business? So if we have the data running in our supply chain or in our warehousing, then we can model that data. So they're the examples that are just practical. What I always recommend though is just start with the warehouse manager and what his problem is or her problem, and then let the technology potentially apply to that rather than the other way around. Right. So if you find problems in your workflow and supply chain and it can be drastically improve the productivity, that's where you want to focus. There's a lot of projects going on and I think at the start we, we raised our hands if we were doing pilots or POCs, those sorts of things. It really has to solve a business problem. So it's very good at those areas mm. uh, and it's very good once you've got the data there. What it's not great at the moment is what we're very good at, which is rationalizing that data. So making decisions with lots of different data. Just think of us crossing the road, what we're doing. Uh, we're looking up and down the street, we're looking at all the vehicles, we're monitoring for other people. Uh, all of that's happening all at once, we don't even know we're doing that. So that's where over time, over the next five to 10 years, this is where the field of generative AI is starting to improve, which is that ability to reason over data and make decisions. Mm. Uh, so that's where we'll see a lot of advancements. So but ultimately, think of it as it's, very, it's mimicking what we're good at. So it's mimicking vision. It's mimicking speech. It's mimicking translation. That's fundamentally what it's really good at, is finding those aspects of uh, what we do and just optimizing them. Uh, ultimately, though, it comes back to the warehouse person or someone in your business and just solving that problem and then testing it uh, and seeing if it can improve the process. Okay. Other thoughts? Uh, yeah, like I know a lot of us food bankers are resource constrained, so use cases um, that we have is in, even in fundraising, there's very good, AI is very good for um, scrubbing like uh, trusts and foundations globally that have a focus on food security. Um, there are customized AI tools, um, some of them are quite expensive, that can do all your prospecting, mm -hmm. help you do grant proposals. Um, uh, some of the, there's one called Instrumental, but I think it's like $500 per month, for example, but it does all of your, you know, your prospecting on corporates, trust foundations. That is a huge amount of research that's available um, and there's lots of other AI kind of fundraising tools as well that are developing. Um, but you can't just use, you know, the enterprise, um, I, I'm afraid to say non-Microsoft tools, <laughs> but you can use different <laughs> tools that are out there that are not that expensive. So even if it's like, tell me the biggest corporates in my country that have, you know, UNSDG 12, in their sustainability strategy and it will give you that back. So that's just a really quick example. Another you know, n example would be uh, scru scrubbing CVs. So you get hundreds of CVs for a role. There is software that can, you can give it the job description, you can upload the CVs. Like as Leon said, you have to be careful. It has to support what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're, I suppose, looking at your team and seeing if there's somebody doing a job and it's taking two days every week or two days every month, is there something that we could be doing to reduce that 
time down so that they be can, can be doing something that will add more value. But on a very practical basis, we're finding it really helpful for fundraising and we're finding it really helpful for those really admin-y tasks that you hate doing. Like, just try it with that. And then obviously we're trying to use AI. We have so much data from our partners, like we're using AI to kind of clean out data that's wrong. So for example, we were getting data from a, a retailer and instead of 100 kgs of avocados, it was put in at a ton and we were like, why are our volumes so much bigger on this day? And instead of going through reams and reams of data, you can use AI to try and pick out the bad data so that you can correct it. Historically, we would have had to go through, you know, have somebody actually go through and kind of see where the bad data is coming from but you can use AI to make that quicker for you. So there are just some examples of what we're using now. And also, I think your brain does get smaller because you start asking AI everything. <laughs> like, well, what birthday present should I get for my husband? Um, so it does start to you know, reduce your brain cells, I think, <laughs> over time. <laughs> funny. Sí. So, yo solo quiero eh, relevar lo que decía León respecto de las proyecciones y las predicciones. Eh, creo que la inteligencia artificial nos puede ayudar muchísimo a los bancos de alimentos a proyectar tanto la oferta como la demanda, eh, proyectar por, por, eh, por estacionalidad, por tipo de empresa, eh, con toda la historia y todos los datos que nosotros tenemos, eh, creo que puede ser muy potente hacer un proyecto de, de, de predicción y por el lado de la demanda también, nosotros tenemos toda la información de las organizaciones sociales, como les decía, las preferencias de organización se puede cruzar por tipo de organización, por región, etcétera, eh, y por lo tanto saber cuántos voluntarios necesitamos, cuántas personal necesitamos, cu cuándo necesitamos aumentar la capacidad, o sea, pueden hacerse cosas muy interesantes eh, con los datos que tenemos y proyectando hacia adelante eh, tanto en el corto como en el mediano y largo plazo. That's great. I want to take questions. Any questions? <coughs> Yeah, I realize I've just pointed kind of broadly. Yes, <laughs> you, that was, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this um, interesting session. It was so enlightening. Um, I am Gabriela Rosato from the Mexican Food Banking Network. And listening to you, I just, you know, recall our experience in, in Mexico with our food banks. And I think food banks and, and association in general are really keen to introduce technology to their processes. So. We have like a wide open door in that sense, but if I look at donors or food companies or retailers with such you know, complex structure with stores, distribution centers and, and plants and sites, um, I, I really see uh, certain resistances, uh, at least in, in, in our case. My team and I work in uh, food system um, recovering, food system uh, sourcing with uh, manufacturers and retail stores, and, and we really see this kind of resisting in making changes because it, uh, it takes time, uh, it takes you know, training staff, training people, changing system from where they are to what we look for. Even if, it's, uh, if, it, if it doesn't cost anything to them, it's cost-free, but there's a lot of resistance. My question is, can you give us like some of, I don't know, ideas or advices when we come to talk to a huge retailer company or a huge food company, how we can convince them to make this change, to use this platform and connect, you know, their sites with our food banks or charities. And uh, yeah, that's the question basically. Thank you so much. Wow. I can, do you go? Um, yeah, I'll give you an example. So when we started working with some retailers, um, they just wanted to give us aggregate data like I have. You know, they wanted to m minimize the amount of work that they were doing on their side, but make it available. So by way of example, they'll say, I have five kg of bread, two kg of fruit and veg, and that's all the data that they wanted to give us because they didn't know or trust us. So. Um, we started with that. And then over time, as we built the trust with the donor, we went from getting very limited data and them doing the minimum amount of work to be able to say to them over time, well, if we could integrate 
we would be able to get you know, a better service for the charities, could they get a better accurate donation, a more traceability and better data. But so we have gone on a journey with some of our partners that started with very low tech, you know, very resistant to moving off. What's easier than sending an email to say, come and collect my food? So uh, th they start with that. And then as you build trust and <coughs> relationship with the donor, you can encourage them to you know, embrace the technology for their benefit. So that's how we've done it. So we've moved some from very low tech to fully integrated, but it has taken, it can take a couple of years. Um, and on the on manufacturing side, we've definitely found that it's been very hard to get them away from just sending an email to the warehouse. Yeah. But now that they have CSRD in Europe or they have reporting requirements, there's another opportunity for them to get involved. But it does take time. And I would start with the low tech and, and build from there then. Yeah. Mm. I, I want to make sure we get a couple more questions in. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Gladi is my name. Uh, Nonga Food Bank, Habiga. And um, I'm thinking uh, with the hay high and uh, uh, increasing uh, climate um, and nature related disasters and emergencies, and increasing humanitarian crisis, and also uh, different languages across African countries based on different ethnicities. Are there uh, projects or initiatives that, are, that will be helping to address uh, this uh, diversity in mm -hmm. languages uh, uh, to help us provide uh, information or uh, meteorological uh, instructions to our uh, beneficiaries uh, when crises are like uh, are coming and also that's one aspect the other aspect is uh, uh, we want to teach our beneficiaries how to cook better uh, with their reci different recipes especially for beans or high on uh, uh, content in the food they eat so so could uh, he also help along this and if there are initiatives that uh, Microsoft or Food Bank uh, thinking around in collaboration with GFN I would love to hear more about that thing yeah. So on the planetary scale and trying to solve natural disasters or even looking at it, it's a really hard space and it's really expensive. So a few years ago, Microsoft did invest in that area to provide those base geospatial data sets to researchers and academia at no cost. So we refer to that as our planetary computer. So anyone that's on the spatial side or that area we have about 120 satellite-based images, uh, data sets from all different organisations across the globe. And then we've stitched those together because what I'm based in New South Wales here and we had a very large bushfire in 2019. If you went to any government website, everything stopped at the border because they weren't integrated. So that's a really good example that go to any part of the world and the way governments work is the data sets stop at the boundary. So Microsoft has created that and that's available to everyone and we've got a number of not-for-profits using that platform, for example, to uh, look at deforestation in the Amazon. An example of that is vision in AI. Is if you notice that the, the heat being generated from the ground, uh, foliage absorbs heat, but also roads appear when deforestation happens. So you can train models to look for roads appearing. Uh, and that's how you can then start seeing whether illegal deforestation is happening at scale. Uh, so that's one example and probably one uh, service that you could utilise. In terms of language, we're continually at Microsoft and our friends at Google and others. So I think as an industry, we're all trying to uplift in this space. So I call us all friends. This is where we do try and work with uh, language owners. So again, we're in Australia now. We have over 200 uh, Indigenous languages here. So it is a little bit difficult in different regions. Uh, but New Zealand, we did that with the Maori language. So we've incorporated that where we worked with uh, indigenous elders and owners of the language and then we're able to incorporate that in. So I think uh, outside here, we could talk a little bit about your unique cases, uh, but probably on the food bank side as well. Yeah, okay. So we're gonna run out of time. So just to <coughs> close on a qu one question, actually, I'll say it differently, just in a sentence or a phrase. Um, how would you describe AI's impact on food access um, and hunger crisis going forward? Who would Can like, I even? 
And you want a phrase, is it? You want a... Um, <laughs> phrase, a sentence, no paragraph. It's potentially <laughs> transformative, um, especially for nonprofits because we're so resource constrained. So we have to use every tool in our arsenal to, you know, find where that surplus food is and how we can best match it to where it's needed most. It's potentially transformative, but it is expensive and it's very hard to keep abreast. I'm sure it's even hard for Microsoft to keep abreast of where this is going. So I would say, and I would call on likes of Microsoft and others to continue to support NGOs to leverage AI for, for good, um, because it is, it's potentially transformative, um, but challenging to keep up to date. So collaboration is really key. Leon? I think it's, again, potential is there and it's empowering. Mm -hmm. So it's how do you get people to be able to have more impact in, in any of their endeavours. So in this space is how do we deliver more food to the people that are hungry? How do we remove bottlenecks in the supply chain? Mm -hmm. How do we match supply and demand? All of these sorts of areas. So it, it has potential there. I think to address the cost, that is where uh, you do, when I say, you do need to lean on the big private industries because they probably have programs. So we've mentioned two large companies, Google and Microsoft on stage. All of these companies where they have their own integrated sustainability models will therefore create uh, access to these soft software platforms. Yeah. So definitely lean on any technology company and find out what programs are available. Right. They all have tech for social impact, not for profit programs and it's designed to empower you. And I think those platforms then will change over time with AI coming in rather than you needing to create it as well. So leverage those big platforms that are available from players like Microsoft and Google and others. Final eh, comments. Yeah. Yo en estos 37 segundos que quedan, eh, creo que el principal mensaje de aprendizaje que nosotros hemos tenido es que tanto la tecnología como la inteligencia artificial tienen que ser un medio para y no un fin. Eh, y en ese sentido eh, que nos ayude a hacer el 80-20, eh, lo perfecto enemigo lo bueno eh, y de repente uno se enamora de la tecnología como un fin y quiere hacer todo un proceso tecnológico y nosotros que todos tenemos recursos limitados y tiempo limitado, creo que hay que priorizar y eficientar donde de real, de realmente la tecnología nos ayuda a nuestros procesos para ser más eficientes, para poder ayudar a más gente y no olviden el medio ambiente que es muy importante en esta conferencia. Great. Okay. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.